Hey, my name is Dan and welcome to the course. I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing and why you should take this course. So I have a lot of courses on Udemy. You may have already seen. I've taught over 6,000 students, probably over 10,000 by the time you're watching this. And there's one core theme to everything I teach and that's freedom. I want to give my students the tools to have more freedom in their life. Now in this course, we're talking about one particular kind of freedom that's very close to my heart and that is location independence. When I was younger, I mean the straight out of college young, I never had a chance to travel. I didn't do the whole backpacking the world thing or um, you know, what a lot of people do the first year after high school or after university. I went right into a job. And but when I was in my mid-twenties, kind of going on 27, I realized this is a big part of my life I was missing. And one of the times I was absolutely happiest was when I was traveling. So I decided to set up my life so that I could be location independent. And what that means is you have the ability to live basically anywhere you want while still earning a good income. In my case, I did it as a freelance copywriter. And personally, I think freelancing is one of the best ways to get started with location independence. And I'll explain why later in the course, but just bear with me. I think freelancing is the right way to get started. And that's coming from my own experience now living around the world for almost four years and meeting hundreds of other people who do the same thing and asking them questions and figuring out what they think is the best way to go as well. So in this course, I'm going to introduce you to 10 different freelance professions that I think are great for being location independent. The point of this course is not to radically redesign your whole life. It's not a total blueprint to location independence. It's meant to be short and sweet and provide a burst of motivation. If you're someone who wants to be location independent, but you're not quite sure yet how to do it, you don't know if your current job would transfer or you don't already have a business, then this course will help you see all the different ways that you could become a freelancer and be able to then travel the world. So it's really meant to be a burst of inspiration and just to open your eyes to what is possible. You know, there's a lot of courses out there that say, hey, if you want to be free, if you want to travel, if you want to be rich, whatever they're promising, uh, do this. Become a copywriter or become a SEO expert or become a social media manager. And my problem with all these courses is they assume everyone is the same. And I know that's not true. For me, copywriting was the way I wanted to freelance and get started traveling. But other people don't like writing. They might prefer being an artist, so graphic design or something like that would be better. Someone who's more technical, you might prefer something like SEO work or programming. And so everyone, I think, is different. And that's why I wanted to provide a course that has 10 different options that would help you become location independent and kind of just inspire you to get started down this journey towards more freedom. Because I can tell you, once you get going, you'll just keep building momentum and you won't ever want to turn back. It really is a great life. And if you're watching this, I can tell you're already interested in that. So let's get right into the content and help you get closer to being location independent as a freelancer. Thanks for watching this lesson, or I should say introduction, and I'll see you in the first lesson. So in this video, I want to talk about a few more things to consider when choosing the right freelance profession for you. In the first lesson about this, I talk first about finding something aligned with your natural talents, passions, or skills. The other thing was to pick something that has the potential to contribute to a profitable business, both so that down the road, if you build your own business, you can reuse that skill set, and also because you're more likely to be paid well by your clients. Now, there's a few more things to consider. These do not override the first two. If there's one clear winner based on the first two criteria, I would lean towards going for that. But a few more things to consider. Firstly is the working conditions or sort of time frame or hours required. So for example, if you are a project manager, you're going to be more likely to have to be tied to your email in order to be in touch with people, take phone calls, things like that. And this is going to somewhat limit your location independence. It doesn't have to fully limit it at all, but it might mean a lot of evenings you have to spend on the phone if you're, say, in Europe and your clients are in North America or something like that. Whereas something like being a freelance copywriter, you have a lot more freedom. Pretty much you meet with the client uh, over Skype or something, you go through the initial work, and then you're off doing the work, and then maybe you set up another meeting. 
but you don't have a lot of meetings. On one project that's maybe worth $5,000, you might meet three times if, you, if you're set up well. And so you have a lot more freedom in terms of your travel. Um, something like being, a, and I don't even mention it in this course, but being like a freelance sales agent. I've met people who do that while traveling and it's really tough because you're always needing to be on the phone. So you have a lot less freedom of your time and in a way less freedom of your location because you're more concerned with time zones, quality of the phone calls and things like that. So that's the first thing to consider. Now, the other thing you want to consider when choosing your freelance profession is long-term viability. We're in a very globalized world and as someone who's location independent, you can take advantage of this by living somewhere where the cost of living is cheap and earning your money from somewhere where the cost of living is high and the wages are high. You can take advantage by hiring your own outsourcers from other countries, but you can also lose out on potential business from other people outsourcing. So think about the ease in which people can outsource what you want to do. If your profession is something like simple programming, it's, um, how do I say? It's easier for someone to outsource that to say Eastern Europe or India and get the exact same work, possibly better work because of like the quality of programmers in Eastern Europe is through the roof. It's some of the best in the world. And yet they'll work for cheaper than someone from America. So you have a risk of basically losing business and not being as in demand because of globalization and outsourcing. Whereas if you look at something like a um, high-end project manager, that's more likely to be a position where someone's going to want to work within their own culture. You know, if I'm hiring someone to manage my whole business, I'm going to want someone that I can pick up the phone and quickly explain what's going on to, not where I'm worried about language barrier and interpretation and what if there's a hurricane in the Philippines and they can't talk to me for a week, things like that. Same with something like copywriting is that's very cultural dependent. You know, even if you're fluent in English, you can't copyright for an American company. You really need to know the culture and the ins and outs of the language to do well for it. So that's another thing to consider is, just the demand and the um, ease of outsourcing. And the last thing, which is really just building on that, goes back to the demand as well. There are definitely some professions that are more popular to go into because of people's just personal leanings. Um, I would say there's more people with an artistic flair who go into something like web design or graphic design than there are who go into copywriting. And so something like copywriting is more in demand relative to the supply. And so with that, you can often earn more money. And so that's something as well to consider if you have a feel for that and just kind of knowing where the market is at. Uh, but again, these three are not as important as the first two, which is where your passions or skills lie. And does this naturally transition into a profitable uh, business in terms of contributing to a profitable business, I should say. All right, thanks for watching this lesson and bearing with me through my slip ups and I look forward to see, seeing you in the next one. So in this lesson, we're gonna talk about being a branding or marketing consultant. Now let's start with branding consultant. This one overlaps somewhat with the graphic design side. A lot of branding consultants are very visual, so they actually start with companies in terms of the fonts they would use, the colors, maybe a logo, and that's part of their whole branding concept. Uh, so there can be some overlap there, but there doesn't have to be. Sometimes branding is about coming up with a company's story or taglines or kind of mission statements, what they're about, and that would overlap a little bit with being a writer. You could also just be a branding consultant where you help companies figure out of who they are, what their brand identity is, and then refer them to a designer or a writer to do those next steps and actually turn that vision and that information you came up with into actual marketing collateral. As a marketing consultant, there's a whole range of things you can do. This can often, again, overlap with service providers. As a copywriter, I would often refer to myself as a marketing consultant because I wouldn't just do copy for companies. I would meet with them, learn about what they wanted to do, what their goals or what their needs were, and then help write copy that would help them attain those goals 
and I would often suggest different projects. I might say, you know what, I know you said you wanted a sales letter, but I don't think that's what you need. I think it would be better if you started with uh, an email newsletter. That will actually have a better uh, impact on your bottom line for you. So marketing consulting can be anything from literally getting paid for your information where you have an expertise and you're doing consultant work and you're helping companies come up with a plan and then referring that work to other people. Or it can be a hybrid where you're consulting, helping them figure out what they need to do and then actually helping deliver those services. Again, it all goes back to helping them with their goal, which is probably in the marketing area going to be about generating more sales and more profit. All right, thanks for watching this video on branding and marketing consulting, and I'll see you in the next one. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about being a website designer or developer. Now this, like being a graphic designer, is a whole can of worms. There's tons of different things you can do on here. For starters, in terms of websites, you have front-end development and back-end development. Back-end is your more technical stuff, setting up the systems that make everything kind of function. If you're looking at sites like e-commerce, you have a lot of back-end development. Front-end is more of what the visitor sees and the front end, essentially, right? The front of the store. And you have different people tend to specialize in one or the other. You also have different frameworks. So some people are WordPress designers and all they offer is WordPress websites. And if that's what you want, they can deliver it well. Others will do just e-commerce custom-made high-end sites where they're building something from scratch based on your needs. And then there's a whole range like this. Um, the nice thing about this range is that you can pick something that works for you based on where you're at. So if you don't have any experience online in terms of programming or web development, but you've liked it, maybe you've tinkered with it a bit and it's something you want to try, then you could start with something simpler like WordPress. In probably a few months, maybe even less, you could learn enough WordPress to get paid to help people build their sites. And then you could offer something simple at first, maybe one or two packages, and then in your spare time, study, study, study. And then maybe you become just a WordPress master or maybe you start to learn other frameworks and programming languages as well and expand what you can offer. I know a lot of people who've done it this way. They've started kind of learning whatever the simplest was and then use their spare time to educate themselves and then that way they can do more complex things and charge more money and everything like that. So, you know, online development, it's can be technical, it can be more artistic, it really depends where you're working in it. You know, if someone's getting a simple WordPress blog, it's probably they're more concerned with the looks and the functionality, where if someone's getting an e-commerce site made up, then they're more looking for, you know, a proper e-commerce site. So they want everything to function well, and they're more concerned with the technical side and also the user experience side. So how things function together, you know, how, Amazon's a great example where they've optimized the user experience to increase everyone's odds of purchasing, basically maximize the dollar they earn from every customer. So on the higher end, clients will be looking for help in things like that, creating that user experience and the all round function of the site. On the lower end, when you're just getting started, people might just want a simple site put up with five or six pages and an email capture box. And you can offer that for a few thousand bucks do a few of those a month and travel the world enjoying yourself. Thanks for watching this video and see you in the next one. Ciao. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about coaching. Now coaching is a great freelance profession to do while traveling because you don't need a lot and you can earn a lot and it's a lot of fun and you get to do something that's really fulfilling if you're the right person to be a coach. So if you're someone who's always the go-to person amongst your friends where people go to you, not looking for advice because good coaching isn't about advice, but you're a good listener and you often ask the right questions and people just seem to trust you and open up to you, you might have the right personality type to become a coach. And the cool thing about coaching is all you really need is a phone. Now, you might use Skype, in which case you need the internet as well, but you can do it just about anywhere in the world. And often, 
Now this depends on the kinds of clients you work with and the kind of coaching you offer, but I found that often coaching clients are really cool people, for lack of a better term. And so they tend to be very understanding if you might have a bad connection the odd day and need to reschedule a call or something comes up, uh, more so than sometimes in other freelancing type professions. I have been a coach for the past two years. It is not my full-time pursuit, but I work with a select group of clients who are trying to become location independent or build a freelancing business. And so I have my own experience with coaching, working remotely, and personally, I love it. It's a great way to uh, have that human contact, to do work you enjoy, and also to, of course, create an income that you know, subsidizes your life as you're traveling. And so whether it's your full-time pursuit or something that you can offer based on your expertise or training, uh, coaching is a great freelance profession to take on while being location independent. If you want to learn more about coaching, I encourage you to spend some time online, but also speak with at least a few professional coaches. There's a lot of courses online that are quite expensive. They might be five or $10,000 for coaching training. And these courses can be very valuable, but it's really important you understand the coaching world first, the kinds of coaching you would want to offer, because you can be an executive coach, a business coach, an accountability coach, a lifestyle coach, a dating coach, a diet coach, a voice, voice vocal coach. You know, there's all kinds of coaching you can do. And so it's really important to know the kind of coaching you want to do before you invest a lot of money into training. So that's it. If you're interested in coaching, do some research, speak to some coaches and get on with it. See you in the next lesson. Thanks for watching this one. All right, so I have saved the best for last, well, at least the best in my own personal bias, which is being a writer. And this is how I started my location independence. I was a freelance copywriter. I was writing for companies, things like web content, you know, the about us services page, things like that, as well as things like sales pages and newsletters for companies. And this is how I started my location independence and how I funded it for my first two years. I think writing is a great freelance opportunity because one, it allows one of the maximum amounts of time and location freedom. You know, you get a project from a client and then your job is to get it done. So you don't have to always be connected to email or the phone. You can go off, do your own thing. And as long as you get that work done by your deadline, most of the time the clients don't really care. You don't have to be in constant back and forth. There's not as many revisions or tweaks as there might be in some other uh, freelance professions as well. I also think it's one of the professions that can't be outsourced, at least not very easily. You know, to be a good, sorry, and when I say outsourced, I mean outsourced to a lower income country, basically reducing the rates for everyone. A lot of professions are now being outsourced to places like India or the Philippines where people work for a lot cheaper. And if you're in those professions, it's going to affect basically what you can earn. And the nice thing about writing is there's so many little details in terms of cultural references and grammar and style that if you're working for any kind of high end writing, writing for companies, newsletters, anything that requires style or persuasion like copywriting, you can't be outsourced. And so there's some good job security there. There's a ton of different areas you can do writing in everything from ghost writing books, to sales pages, copywriting, advertisements for companies, to things like writing articles and newsletters. Now, I'm gonna do a little shameless self-promotion here, but if you've watched this far, you probably enjoy my style, or at least you're willing to put up with me. So I do wanna encourage you, if you think writing is for you, if you have a way with words, or like myself, you just romanticize the thought of traveling the world and writing from cafes all over for your clients or for yourself, then I do have another course here on how to become a freelance writer. And in this course, I go through all the different ways you can earn a living as a writer. The industries, the projects, the kinds of rates you can expect, how much to charge, what kind of projects never to do, what kind of projects to try to find. There's over three hours of content, and so you can imagine why I couldn't fit it all in this one video about writing. So if you think that writing is the freelance route for you to go, then check out that course. 
um, or another course on it, but I think mine's the best. That's why I made it. Some shameless self-promotion, I apologize, but you know, it is what it is. And, uh, and that's it. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and the other videos on becoming a freelancer and the different freelance professions available to be location independent. And I'll see you in the next video before we just finish up the course here. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. So in this video, I just want to talk to you a little bit about ways you can interact with me and uh, ways that will help me improve the course and also help you learn a lot more in the course. So one of the aspects is the discussions up here. And so if you want to ask a question, maybe you want advice on your own situation as it relates to one of the lessons, or maybe you just want to share one of your own experiences. You just uh, go here in the class and click add discussion. And then you just uh, type the title of your discussion and then the actual discussion here and then you can post it and you can do this um, as a general discussion or you can actually do it with each lecture so if you're watching lecture number eight you can add the discussion there um, the second thing i want to talk about is just leaving a review so if you've made it this far in the course i'm hoping you're enjoying it and getting some value from it and if you want to share that with other prospective students, it really helps them know what they're getting into, basically what the course is about, if it's worth their uh, investment and their time. And so to do that, you just go up here and you click the write a review and you choose your rating and then you type basically the title of your review and the review here. Now you don't have to add a title and a review, but it's much more helpful to people to see that and these questions here are just some suggestions from Udemy in terms of what you might want to write about in your review, but you can write whatever you want. You don't have to follow that guidance. Um, and, uh, and that's it. Oh no, there's one more thing. So if there's someone in your life that you think this course would be enjoyable for, uh, you know, you in my course about becoming a writer and you think, you know what, my uncle has wanted to be a writer his whole life. I should send this to him. You can go up here to the share function and um, you can either buy the course as a gift for someone um, if that's something you wanted to do or you can just share it uh, on Facebook, Twitter or email as well. And again, it really helps me spread the word and I massively appreciate it. Thank you for watching and see you throughout the rest of the course. So there you have it. Thank you for watching. You've got 10 ways that you could become a location independent freelancer now. No more excuses. It's time to take action, decide a route to go and start going down that path towards your own location independent lifestyle. Remember a few of the things we talked about. When you're looking at which profession to pick, start off looking at your childhood, high school, university and jobs and look what were the ongoing skills, talents, passions you had. You know, for me when I was a kid, I didn't even remember this actually, but I'd written a sales letter to my parents to ask them to increase my allowance. And my mom showed this to me a few years ago. She had it in, you know, one of those memory boxes moms have, and it had, it was a proper sales letter. It went through what I was proposing, why it benefited them and why they should do it. And then included a trial period where they could reverse their decision if they wanted. And I think, I think I was 10 or 12 on this, I, but that kind of age. So there was um, signs of it all the way back. And I bet for you there is too if you look. If you're drawing a blank, ask friends, ask family and say, hey, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to do next. What are some of the things that I was good at or had an interest in when I was younger? And I bet you'll find something there. The other thing is try to have this align with a profitable business skill. So something that can contribute to the bottom line of a business. This way, when you start your own business down the road, if that's something you want to do, you can use this skill to be more successful sooner. It also means clients are more likely to want to hire you and pay you more. So that's it. Go through, look over the 10 options. If something hasn't jumped out to you at you, I should say right away, narrow it down to one or two, and then start trying to figure out the next steps from there. I do offer other courses on Udemy around freelancing and location independence. If you've enjoyed this course, I encourage you to take a look at those. And that's about it. Um, what else? That's it, guys. Thank you for joining this course. Thank you for giving me your attention and trusting me with your time. 
And if you've enjoyed the course, please do leave a review as well. It's really easy. It takes a few seconds and helps get the word out about this course. And if there's anything you'd like to see in future courses or there's something you didn't understand in this course, feel free to message me personally or open a discussion point and I'll do my best to help you out there. Thanks again for taking this course and see you in the next one. Bye. So this is my fifth course filmed here on Udemy. And because of that, I know that one of the questions I'll be asked, and you might be wondering is what's next? You've been through the course, you've enjoyed the content and you, you've picked a profession or at least narrowed it down to probably two or three that you think could be right for you. And you're, at, you're wondering what to do next. Well, I have a few options here and a few are self-promoting. So I apologize for that. But if you've enjoyed my teaching, then it makes sense that you might want to take another course from me. So I have a few more classes on Udemy that might be of interest to you. I have one teaching location independence, and this is going to teach you all the business side of travel and the other living side. So things like finding housing, making friends, getting set up, how to stay healthy when you're traveling, all that stuff on location independence. There's, I think, three or four hours of content in that course. I also have another course on freelancing where you're going to learn the business side how to charge, how much to charge, how to get clients, how to manage difficult clients, get paid on time, all that stuff. It's some of the more advanced um, stuff that basically I had to learn myself and that I've also coached and taught a lot of people, uh, newer freelancers in as well. And I wanted to make a course sharing that. So that could be a good course where you learn sort of the business side of freelancing. And it might even help you if you haven't yet chosen which freelance profession to do. It might even help you narrow that down because you'll learn a little more about what freelancing is like and kind of the business side of it. And lastly, I do also have a course around writing and I have a course around landing pages, which is the marketing side. So if you're interested in doing copywriting or uh, marketing consulting, my landing page course has a lot of good information in there. And if you're interested in writing, then of course, my course on how to become a writer has a lot of good information there. And so that's it. I encourage you to check out those other courses. And as always, if you have any questions, anything in this course that you didn't understand or you'd like added or you'd like some just feedback on, maybe you, you're trying to choose between two different professions and you're not sure, post it as a discussion. And I can't promise I'll get back to you the same day because well, I'm traveling and I'm enjoying life, but I will get back to you as soon as I can and try to offer as much advice as I can to your personal situation. Thanks again for watching. If you've enjoyed this, do leave a review and hope to see you in another course or in the discussion board on this one and just get to know you. Have a great day. See you soon. This is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. Thank you for riding with MTA New York City Transit. So you want to be location. So you want to be location independent. So you want to be location independent. Well, I don't blame you. So I just want to share a quick video on how you can watch videos in Udemy at increased speed. Personally, I'm a huge fan of watching videos faster. Uh, same with listening to audios. You find you save a lot of time and really quickly your brain adjusts. And with technology now, you can watch videos at one and a half or two times speed without really losing anything. And the voice doesn't go all chipmunky. And I know I can be a little long winded as well sometimes. And so I really encourage you to check out watching the videos at one and a half or two times speed in order to do that. Uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to uh, have your account set up to be on the HTML5 browser. So you go into account or profile and then preferences here 
and you just change it to HTML5. And then what happens is when you go to watch videos, to do, here we go. Say you're watching a video here, and then when you are watching the video, you can go up here to the top left and adjust the video speed. If you really want to slow it down for something important or if you're taking notes, you can do that. And then you can go up all the way to two times speed. And so that's a way to save a lot of time. And for me, I just find it really helps me focus actually a lot more. At one time speed, I kind of, if I'm watching other people's classes, I just zone out. And so I really recommend trying one and a half or two times speed and save yourself a ton of time and do a lot more learning. Hope you found this video helpful. See you in the next lesson. Welcome to the first lesson of the meat and potatoes of this course. The 10 freelance professions you can do while traveling the world and earning a pretty good living. I'm going to go through in a rough order of more technical to less technical. And that's about it. Other than that, they're sort of all in here in whatever order and I'd go through them and see what ones jump out as you as your calling and what you want to be doing to be location independent. For the first one, I'm going to start with the traditional location independent digital nomad job, which is that of a programmer. It's so common, in fact, that I'm even asked about it. When I tell people about my lifestyle, they usually assume that I'm a programmer because for years, programmers have been able to just travel and work on their projects and it's really like no big deal to them. Now, there's a few things with programming. You have different levels. If this is something that's new to you, you don't have a programming background, but you do have an interest. You like computers and the more technical side of things. Uh, one thing you should know is that the world has changed quite a bit recently in that one, you can do free education to learn how to be a programmer. MIT has all their courses online. You can go online for free and learn from the best in the world how to be a programmer. There's also different levels of programming. So you can be a full-blown computer science degree holding, know everything in and out programmer, or you can specialize in one framework. For instance, some people are WordPress programmers and they learn PHP and HTML and they specialize in that area. And it doesn't take that long, maybe a few months to get enough of an understanding to do well that way. Whereas if you want to be programming it in a more complex language, you know, someone who's designing software or games, that can take years and years of experience. So if you're interested in programming, you can start to research more and find out the different languages and the different things you could learn that would allow you to basically earn your living doing some kind of computer programming while you are traveling. Thanks for watching this one and we'll see you in profession number two. So the second profession I'm going to talk about is being an SEO consultant. SEO stands for search engine optimization. And these days, just about all traffic to websites. Okay. I shouldn't say all traffic to websites, but a very good amount comes from Google and companies are desperate to rank well on Google. You know, if someone has a problem, they're looking for a plumber, they're looking for a maid, they're looking for a new graphic designer. They go to Google and they type in that search and the companies that rank high make a killing and the companies that aren't there don't and they miss out on a huge amount of business. So companies will hire SEO professionals to help them rank well on Google. This involves basically setting up and optimizing their page. So it follows the technical specs that Google looks for. You can tell I don't know a ton on SEO here, uh, but it's basically you have your basic stuff where you're setting up the page properly. You're making sure the keywords are built into the page. That's called on-site SEO. And then there's also off-site SEO where you would have articles, uh, YouTube channel, maybe social media accounts, all these things linking to the business. And those can be good ways to rank as well. Um, often SEO works on a contract. So you work for a company in an ongoing basis for, you know, $500 per month and I'll manage your SEO and I guarantee you'll stay on the first page of Google for three keywords. Things like that are common contracts. If you have a technical love, you know, if you like spreadsheets, numbers, analysis, SEO might be something for you. 
where you can really get on that the technical side, analyze how the page are doing, look at ways of improving, and then track it month after month and see how it's doing. For me, I'm terrible at this. It wouldn't work. I like to do something once, you know, build a course, put my heart and soul into it, and then sort of back off. Whereas something like being an SEO consultant, you do have a lot of upfront work, but then there's the ongoing work because things are always changing, Google's always changing, and competition will spring up. So SEO involves that ongoing analysis and work as well. All right, that's it for being an SEO professional. Hope you enjoyed this one and see you in the next one. So the next one I want to talk about is being an AdWords or advertising consultant. Now, the majority of this now, in terms of online advertising, is Facebook ads and Google ads. But there's definitely other avenues of online advertising, from other search engines like Bing or Yahoo to Twitter and now Pinterest and LinkedIn also offer advertising. When companies are spending a lot of money to bring traffic to their page, it's worth it for them to pay someone who really understands online advertising to optimize it so that every dollar they spend brings a better result. I have a friend who does this, and it's amazing the difference between an expert's ability to set up an advertising campaign and monitor it and get the most money for your dollar versus the layman's attempt of just setting something up and you know, spending money and hoping for the best. So if you're someone who likes the technical side, because there's a lot of analysis here of looking at conversion rates, A-B testing, seeing what ads are working best, but there's also the marketing side where you're actually writing the advertisements usually. Uh, these are usually short, right? Like Google AdWords, you're not doing a whole newspaper advertisement, but you are coming up with the advertisements usually and helping sort of manage that whole campaign often. So you're not just tweaking their results, but you might look at their landing page and things like that, look at their website and give them feedback and say, okay, you need to have a better landing page if you want this to be successful. And then, you know, I'll do the advertisement, something like that. And advertising is a great consistent income because it's like SEO, you will often be paid on a retainer. So you set it all up and that might be an upfront cost and then you're paid every month to uh, track it and make sure the ads are still working and the ads that stop working to replace them and try something new. So you're doing a lot of work upfront and you do have ongoing work, but probably you're doing less work for more money after the first month once you get everything working well. And you're also directly tied into your client's income source. So if you're helping them make more money through their advertising, they'll happily pay you what you're worth and allow you to enjoy your travel and location independence. Thanks for watching this video on AdWords consulting and advertising consulting in general, and I'll see you in the next one. So we're a little ways into the course and I want to take a minute to talk about how you actually choose what freelancing profession is best for you. Now maybe you're already a freelancer with a chosen profession and you're just watching this for fun or you want to see maybe there's some other options or just see how your option ranks in my opinion, but you're probably still trying to decide what is the best way to go. So I think it's really important that your freelancing profession do two things. One, it should be matched up with a natural talent, interest, or skill you have. Now, in my case, I always knew I enjoyed writing. And I, as I was getting older and had my own business before becoming a freelancer, I did a lot of marketing sort of writing. And so I was reading about copywriting and gaining some experience and I liked it and I, I had gotten good feedback from people who read the work I'd done. And so it was a natural fit for me to then turn that into my freelancing profession. Now, you might not have that easy of a path, but I'm sure if you think back to high school or university, there's some area of the 10 different professions we'll cover in this course that was interesting to you. You know, maybe you really liked art class, maybe you really liked analytics and statistics, maybe you were drawn to something around like management. When you had group projects, you were always the leader, you always told people what to do or helped organize everything. And there's hints there, there's hints at where your natural skill set lies. So this is the first thing, because if you have a choice, why not work in your natural skill set and make everything easier? Now, the second thing that's important is the freelance profession you choose 
should lend itself to building a profitable business. So this is important in two ways. Let me explain. The first thing is that at some point you may want to stop freelancing. For me, freelancing is a transition into having your own business. I mean, ultimately to be location independent and really enjoy the travel, you want to also have some residual income. The same way I now create courses like this and I've written books, that provides another source of income beyond my freelancing. And I think a lot of people try to follow that path. They start freelancing and then they see how they can move towards more of a, not traditional business, but a residual income based business where they have some consistent payments. And a great thing about starting as a freelancer is you can just transition your freelance skills to help you out. So for me, all the time I spent learning copywriting and helping other people with their copywriting has provided a skill set I can use for my own business now. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is that your customers, how much they will want to pay you will be tied in with the kind of results you get them. So if you're someone like a copywriter or an advertising expert, your work will directly affect their bottom line. Whereas other work, um, for instance, well, I'm going to say branding, but that branding can directly affect the bottom line, but it's harder to be specific. So if you design logos for someone, it's going to be harder to charge more because a lot of new business owners are just looking for sort of the cheapest option that looks okay. You know, they don't want to spend a ton of money because they don't know how that logo will necessarily earn them more money. Whereas if your job is to design the graphics on a sales page, then that company is going to think, hey, if this sales page is better, we'll directly earn more profit the same month maybe that we're paying this person. So it's easier to then be paid more. So I hope that makes sense. So the first thing you want to look for when choosing your profession is does it align with some kind of natural skill set you have? I suggest working backwards on this. Start making a list of sort of the things that were interesting to you when you were a kid, when you were in high school, when you were in university, if you went that route, and even in jobs you've had, what did you enjoy doing? And then reference that throughout this course to the different things I'll talk about and see what lines up most for you. And the second thing is to make sure that what you're doing can be directly tied to uh, building a profitable business. This will allow you to charge more and earn more when you're freelancing and it will also allow you to more easily transition into a profitable, bu profitable business yourself if you choose to do that. Thanks for watching this lesson and I will see you in the next one. In this lesson, we're going to talk about being a project manager or virtual assistant. Now, these are two different professions. I'm including them together because there's some overlap and mostly because I want to give you the most value I can for this course. And I really have about 15 different professions I wanted to include. So I'm condensing some two into one video. So hope you'll forgive me for that. Now, you're probably familiar with virtual assistants and the general discussion around them is often about hiring overseas people. A lot of digital nomads or online entrepreneurs hire an assistant from the Philippines for a few dollars an hour and have them do sort of busy work. Now, the other side to this is that there are a lot of entrepreneurs who work online and need an assistant or a project manager. Most of the time they more want a project manager because they don't have that much busy work. They're not sending their wife flowers or making an appointment with the dry cleaners, but they really want to get stuff done and they don't want to send it to the Philippines or to India. They want to deal with someone where they can have a proper conversation. There's no cultural barriers. There's not as many time zone issues and there's more kind of consistency and reliability. You know, no matter how good things are in terms of education or um, cultural training, there's still a difference between working, you know, as a Canadian, if I'm working with a fellow Canadian or a Brit or an American or working with someone from somewhere like the Philippines in terms of our ability to communicate really quickly and fluently. So someone who's struggling online was probably going to look to hire someone for a few dollars an hour. But someone who has a good business online is okay to pay $30, $40 an hour for their project manager because they're valuing their own time maybe at $100 or $200 an hour. And they want a really good project manager to take it on. So to be a good project manager, 
you need to be good at organizing things, taking charge of things and having that drive. So often as a project manager, an entrepreneur might give you sort of the overview for a project and what needs to get done and expect you to then go out and hire the right people, put together the team, kind of set up the plan for it all and run with what was basically a, a loose vision for that. Uh, so you need that drive and ambition and ambition. That's what one of the big differences between a virtual assistant, where a virtual assistant, you're more just getting things done for people, helping them stay organized, maybe doing light accounting, invoices, setting up calendars, helping with email, things like that. Um, you, you, know, you don't necessarily need experience for this, but if you do have past business experience or school experience, you know, in terms of like a business administration degree or something like that, it will obviously be helpful. But the biggest thing is gaining that experience. So you might, in this case, start off as a virtual assistant where you're doing easy stuff, kind of no brainer work, and you get good at it, you be consistent, you be reliable and proactive. This is a big thing I hear from entrepreneurs is we want someone who's proactive working with us. The reason we want to outsource is to save our own time and kind of mental space so we can focus on the bigger picture stuff or creative projects. And so the more you can be proactive and sort of say, okay, here's the problem. Why don't I try to solve it myself? And as long as I'm not going to you know, destroy anything, there's not a lot of harm. That's, that's very popular. That's a well um, desired, desired probably the right word, not the right word, uh, trait in hiring a project manager or a virtual assistant. So you could start off as a virtual assistant and then build your way up to more of a project manager role, taking on big things, overseeing the whole project, and really having the trust of your employer. This profession can be great in terms of transitioning into your own business down the road and potentially doing so as a partnership. There's a lot of entrepreneurs who are on the opposite end of project manager. They're sort of visionaries, they're creative, they're very good at coming up with a concept, but they're very poor at executing it. And they love to work with a great project manager who can take a concept, help execute it and make it happen. And rather than getting paid, what you could always do is do some projects on like a profit share and gradually build your own business that way, where you're either as a profit share or an equity share and you partner up with people and uh, transition into having your own uh, passive income streams and your own business that way. All right, so that's it in terms of being a project manager or virtual assistant. Hope you've enjoyed it. See you in the next lesson. So it seems these days just about everyone is a social media expert of some sort. And well, I'm not going to encourage you to be a social media expert here. But one of the professions you can do as a freelancer and can do quite successfully working anywhere around the world is being a social media manager. Companies want to be on social media. They want to have a Facebook page set up. They want to have Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn, depending on where their audience is but most companies don't want to do it themselves. This is especially true of smaller uh, business owners. So there's a three or four person company or even a one person company. They usually don't have the time to manage all their social media accounts, but they know they need it done. So if you're someone who enjoys social media, you enjoy posting, you seem to get a lot of likes on your stuff. You just have a natural inclination for that world. This could be something you consider doing. In my opinion, the most successful social media managers are able to tie in the basic stuff, the stuff that business owners feel they have to do with more advanced stuff that helps business owners be more profitable. So a lot of companies want to be on social media because they feel like they have to, and they're not going to pay that much money when they have to do something. It's like if you have to go to the dentist, you're like, okay, who's kind of the cheapest guy who's not going to make me bleed a lot. And that's what you go for, right? But if you want to do something, you're looking for the best person and you're willing to pay more. So combining the basic stuff, like I'll set you up a Facebook page, I'll have a Twitter with minimum number of posts. That's what companies have to have or they feel like they do. But combining that with things that will make them more profitable, like I'll also manage your Facebook ads, I'll use Twitter to connect with other businesses and set up partnerships for you, I'll message people on LinkedIn to promote your stuff, things like that, proactive things that will actually benefit their bottom line 
If you do that, you'll be among the top 10% of social media managers and you'll be ridiculously popular. And with that, no one will care if you're sitting on a beach in Costa Rica while you're managing their account, even though they're paying you the same rate they would pay someone back in New York. So that is being a social media manager. Hope you've enjoyed this video and see you in the next one. In this video, we're going to talk about becoming a graphic designer. It's probably one of the easiest ones for me to explain because it's pretty simple. Did you have some kind of artistic inclination? Now, whether that's having the coolest room as a kid where you know how to lay things out and set it up nicely, or whether you like to draw or just are drawn to the visual world, that's going to be your first step. I would be a hopeless graphic designer. I tried, I learned some Photoshop. I just, I couldn't do it personally. And I know people who have such a natural talent for it, they can make anything look beautiful. So within graphic design, there's a few different routes you can take. Well, that's an understatement. There's probably dozens of routes you can take. There's a few I'm going to talk about here. One is the all round kind of graphic designer where you'd act more as a consultant. Um, in my, I have a different course on freelancing, kind of the business side. I talk about the difference between being in more of a consultant role where you will basically ask questions and find out what project they need and then deliver that. Or you can be more of a productized service where you have a clear offering and you just re-deliver that offering over and over again. So as a graphic designer, you could be basically open and you say, hey, let's meet, find out what they need and do that for them. Or you could offer one or two clear products. An example would be doing um, book design layout. So working with authors who want to self-publish, but they want their book to look really good, both the digital version and the print version. This would also include like cover design. And yes, you can go on Fiverr and buy book covers for $5, but a lot of authors want something better than that. And they might pay anywhere from $100 to $300, say, for a book cover. And then what it would be on basically with you is to optimize your efficiency. So if you can do one cover in a day or two where you're good at understanding what they want, learning about their project and then delivering, then you could earn an, a pretty good income that way and you don't have to worry about a lot of ongoing uh, meetings and things like that. Whereas when you're doing more consultations, say you work for a company and you have a larger $5,000 package where you're helping them with their brand and their colors and everything like that, then that's a more ongoing project with a lot of emails, a lot of back and forth, and uh, more ups and downs in terms of your income if you're doing that. And so those are kind of the two routes to take. Um, I'm not sure what way I would take if I was going down it, but I'd probably lean towards the productized way, especially if I was going to be traveling. So have one or two clear things I did really well, get the word out there and get people to pay me for delivering specific projects. So hope you enjoyed this video on graphic design and see you in the next one.